Okay, we're recording. Thank you. Do I need to click continue? Uh, yes, you will have to click. Everybody okay. has to. I think everybody has to click continue. Yes. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, thanks for organizing this, Andre. Um, it's a, I think it's a great idea to get people to share some of their ideas about proof assistance. And as Andre mentioned, Beluga is a proof assistant or programming environment we've been developing at Miguel for the past 10 years now. Um, and it is a sort of domain specific proof and programming environment, which is meant to help you mechanize the meta theory about uh, formal systems. So, um, so let me start that we're all on the same page. I'll start slow. Um, so what is mechanized meta theory? Well, we uh, often start with a theory definition. So that could be an operational semantics, a type system, a type theory, some program transformations, various kinds of logics. And of course, we don't define these theories just in isolation. We also would like to sort of ensure that these definitions make sense. And that's why we are proving various kinds of meta theoretic results. For example, uh, type safety, decidability of type checking, soundness of a particular program transformation, consistency results, normalization, and so on. And normally we do these uh, developments on paper, but if we do it in a proof assistant, then we talk about mechanized meta theory. So if you have a choice uh, of proof assistants, you could use Isabel, Koch, Akta. Uh, these are very general purpose proof assistants, or you can use a more special purpose proof assistant uh, among them, for example, Beluga. So, um, so why do we mechanize, right? So we mechanize uh, these formal systems typically to establish trust and uh, also to avoid flaws in these developments. But getting these proofs right is, is somewhat tricky. So I want to contrast uh, you know, how we do proofs on paper versus how we do proofs uh, in a proof system. So when you do it on paper, uh, it's sometimes challenging to keep track of all the definitions and the details. You might change some definition in your operational semantics or in your type system. And that will have an impact on how, uh, how the proof develops. And you have to sort of keep track of what lemmas are actually impacted by this change. And then that might be kind of difficult to understand all these interactions between these different features. It's also quite easy to skip over details because we're kind of confident that, yes, this part will be working out fine. Um, and these difficulties sort of increase in size. And there certainly is a whole history where things uh, went wrong. Um, so one might think, you know, proof assistants are, are a good, uh, good solution to this problem. Uh, because in some sense, you know, if we have a good implementation of the theory and we have dilemmas and then uh, if we change something, hopefully the type checker or whatever proof checker we're using flags the lemma that is now not valid anymore. But the truth of the matter is if you've used the proof assistant, then there's a lot of infrastructure you might need to build up in order to get sort of started in the first place. There's a lot of uh, experience uh, that goes in and there are a lot of choices uh, that you need to make. And the choices start usually by uh, choosing how we want to represent the grammar of this formal system we're working with, how we want to represent uh, things like variables, variable bindings, a set of hypotheses, the context, uh, how we want to model substitutions, renaming, all these things we teach in an undergraduate class on logic or programming languages. But uh, once we're at the stage where we mechanize, you know, or, or where we talk about the meta theory itself, these are things we don't really uh, spell out in detail. But once we are using a proof assistant, this is what we need to do. And that can be quite, quite time consuming. And there are a lot of choices from De Bruyne, Weltscope De Bruyne, Weltype De Bruyne, parametric hierarchic syntax, nominal logic, nominal syntax, uh, locally nameless. So which one should one actually uh, in some sense, using what are the trade-offs. And a lot of people don't understand what the trade-offs are because it's not so, not so obvious. So experience starts to matter quite a lot. And I want to sort of share with you uh, the experience by Ezra Cooper. And he was a PhD student, and I think his experience is quite typical for anybody who has used a proof assistant for the first time. Uh, so he had heard about the Problem Art Challenge uh, back in 2005. Uh, and he was a PhD student, and he was, uh, oh, I'm going to do mechanization of the normalization of the simply time lambda calculus. And so his development is all up uh, online in his GitHub repository. It was done in Koch. And he chose uh, the brain uh, for an encoding of the variables. And so he wrote, to those that doubted the brain, I wish to prove them wrong or discover why they were right. 
Now, after some years and many hundred hours of labor, I can say with some authority, they were right. The burn indices are foolishly difficult for this kind of proof. The full proof runs 3,500 lines, although that relies on a further library of 1,900 lines, of basic facts about lists and sets. And the most painful part were the 1,600 lines that are used to prove facts about shifting and substitutions. So the good news is, uh, there are better ways to do things also in COC, uh, but I think, um, um, I think it does sort of explain, you know, that it's very easy to, to get bogged down in technical details. And it's not so obvious what, what a kind of encoding one should use for a particular domain. And even for the simply type lambda calculus, this isn't something uh, we fully understand. So the question I've been interested in is, languages that make it easier to mechanize meta theory. Um, so what are good abstractions we can give to, uh, to the users, to programmers, improved developers, uh, which they then can employ. And so what I want to do is I want to uh, give an introduction to some of these common issues. So uh, some of these issues are probably well known, um, but it's good to sort of review them. Um, and then I'll, I'll give a brief introduction on how we deal with these in Beluga. Beluga is a system that uh, follows sort of the, the lineage of uh, logical frameworks. So starting in, uh, with ELF in the 1990s, and then with 12 uh, by the end of uh, the 1990s and 2000. Um, Beluga is sort of uh, the, the next uh, evolution in that, uh, in, that, uh, in that spirit of proof assistance. And most recently, we also developed an interactive uh, proof environment, which allows you to uh, develop these proofs interactively. And so what I do is, uh, what I, I, I thought I'll do is I'll, um, I'll talk a bit about the, how we encode things, what's the theoretical ideas behind it, and then I'll show you how we uh, can do this interactively. Uh, and I'll pick a very simple example, hopefully. Um, but sort of a, to, to highlight sort of this idea that we, Beluga is really um, a language that provides you with primitives and abstractions. It's really sort of, uh, and I think that's something we, we really need in general uh, in proof assistance. And in that sense, I really very much like the quote by Barbara Lishkov. This is a quote about her work on data abstraction, where she said, you know, the motivation behind the work in very high level languages is to ease the programming task by providing the programmer with a language containing primitives or abstractions suitable to their program, uh, to their problem area. And then the programmer is able to spend their effort in the right place and concentrating on solving the problem and the resulting program will be more reliable as a result. So I think the same kind of should apply to proof languages. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt, especially if it is uh, more uh, the technical part. Uh, so I think there is a hand raise <laughs> possibility and maybe Anya can also watch if somebody raises a hand and interrupt me um, because I might not see it directly. So the concrete example I want to look at is uh, type preservation, just because it's a very small example, uh, but we also have done normalization. If there's time, I'll, I'll also can talk about type uniqueness. But hopefully, even with the small example of type preservation, you'll see that the tools we have, or the right abstractions we have, they can have a very profound influence on our thinking habits. Uh, so even if you don't use a tool like Beluga itself, hopefully these kind of the, this way of thinking can impact uh, how you also develop things in a, in a proof assistant like COC or ACTA. All right, so uh, let's get uh, started. Okay, how, to, how do we actually program and reason with formal systems uh, in Beluga? So the first thing is we need to uh, represent types and terms. So here our object language is the simply type lambda calculus and we encode these, um, this object logic uh, in, in the logical framework. So the logical framework app is a dependently typed lambda calculus, um, and we're encoding a lambda calculus in it. So we have uh, types, uh, natural numbers, uh, and function spaces. Uh, we have variables. Um, then we have the constructor lamb, which uh, takes in also the type of the, the argument, A. And then we have another constructor app. So the first thing you have to do is you have to encode this language somehow. And in LF, uh, what we do is we define uh, two type families, one type uh, for the types, uh, so TP, and one for terms, TM. And then for each of the constructors, 
we have um, a one constant okay, of a type. So nat is a constant of uh, tp. Uh, arrow is a constant that takes in two arguments, tp and tp, and produces a tp. And on the level of terms, we have two constants, lamb and app. App takes in two terms, uh, producing another term. And lamb takes in a type annotation a. And then it takes this, this function space from term to term, which is here in orange. And that describes this variable binding of uh, the fact that x binds, is bound any occurrence inside uh, here in the sim. So if we model the binding that exists in our object language via the, um, via the lambda uh, function of LF itself. So here are a couple of examples. Um, on paper, we write the identity function, um, lambda x, x, and that turns into the constructor lamb that is applied to that, which is the type annotation. And then we have the Greek lambda, lambda x, x, which denotes the identity function and um, is, is the LF uh, lambda function. So any kind of binding we have in the object language is modeled by uh, LF lambda functions. So we see the second example, we have some overshadowing, lambda x and then lambda x, which is a function returning x. So overshadowing comes in naturally here because uh, it's just uh, what overshadowing is in, in LF. Or, uh, so we have two nested lambda functions uh, inside. And very naturally, the innermost one overshadows the, the outer one. So this one here uh, binds naturally the innermost one. And here we have uh, x and f. And uh, over here, we have here lambda x and lambda f. And um, there, uh, it's just a direct encoding. So this is what is called high order abstract syntax. Um, it really uniformly models these binding structures. And we often refer to this orange function space we have here in LF or uh, this. Greek lambda I write here as, uh, as an intentional function, because what we ultimately would like to do is we would like to analyze and traverse these kind of lambda terms, because we might want to write a recursive function on them, or if we have actually modeled derivation trees, we'd like to do an, a proof by induction on these lambda terms or these derivation trees. These functions are very weak. They don't have any recursion. They don't have any pattern matching. Uh, it's really just a dependently type lambda calculus. That's all there is. Okay. So um, this is not an inductive definition here. Um, you know, TP in a, in a system like Koch or Acta, you might define something inductively. This is not an inductive definition. It's purely defining a bunch of constants that have a particular type. And you also notice that there's no constant for variables uh, because variables are modeled implicitly here with this LF function space, uh, which is in, in orange. But the benefit of it is that we inherit alpha renaming and substitution, because of course we know what it means to do alpha renaming in LF. And we do know what it means to apply one of these Greek lambda uh, functions, right, uh, to, to a term, because that's what is part of the, the meta theory uh, of LF. So this idea um, can be applied not only for representing terms, uh, it can also be applied to representing evaluation rules, for example. Right? So here we have um, uh, small step semantics, m steps to m prime, and uh, it's a call by value semantics. So we are evaluating from left to right the applications. So the F1 evaluates the first part m uh, recursively to some m prime, and then we'll uh, return m prime to n. If the first part is already a value, we'll evaluate the argument, that's E up two. And eventually we'll come to this reduction rule, which is E up apps, which says that uh, we want to apply a value to uh, this, this lamb function we have in our object language. And that means we need to do substitution. And this is substitution in our object calculus. And so when we uh, represent this, uh, we again define a type family. Uh, this case here, step takes in two arguments, it's TM and TM, so it's a dependent type. And uh, it encodes this relation between two terms. And each of the rules is a constant. So I chose here like slightly uh, different syntax. We both uh, support both kinds of syntax in Beluga. Uh, although it might look a little bit more like, like an inductive or a recursive type, it's again not a recursive type. It's just defining some constants. Each inference rule is a constant and it has a particular type. So EF1 just says if you give me a witness for uh, stepping m to m prime, then I can step app mn to app m prime n. 
Uh, and the most interesting part is the last uh, rule, EAP apps, which says that if B is a value, then I can step app lam a m and this m here i don't know can you see my cursor uh, this m okay it's yellow good um uh, this m is a function right it's from tm to tm and so uh, i can actually uh, now pass v to m and that is the lf application uh, where i can uh, pass v to m so i use this function m and apply it and that will do the substitution uh, for me. So I piggyback on a lot of the, of the generic infrastructure LF gives me as well. LF knows how to apply functions and therefore knows how to do substitutions. Uh, LF knows what it means to have distinct variables and renaming. Uh, LF knows how to do uh, the scope. So the meta language is powerful enough for these kinds of things. And last, uh, you know, you might think, well, how do I do a reason with assumptions? And so that example would be typing rules. And if you have here M, uh, the app is just saying M is a function from A to B, and N is of type A, and so the application is of type B. But if you have an abstraction, we need to somehow say that I assume X is of type A, and then I can prove that M is of type B. Then, therefore, the, the lambda function is indeed of type A or B. And so there are really two things I want to point out that are introduced. One is x, which is a new fresh variable that doesn't exist before, and the assumption that x is of type A. And so both of these are introduced. And in this derivation here, this is really parametric in x and hypothetical uh, in m. And so the way I've described it here is in this very two-dimensional way, very much like uh, Genson wrote his, his uh, natural reduction rules um, without making the context really explicit. Uh, because this view directly translates into uh, a view where we think of this kind of hypothetical derivation as a function, where you give me a proof for some x or for a term that was going to replace x, which is of type A. And once you give it to me, I can actually then produce the term at uh, the proof that m is of type B. So uh, when we, we represent the typing judgment again as a relation between terms and types, and uh, the app rule is a constant. Um, it just has uh, two premises. M is of type arrow AB, N is of type A. We can construct a witness for M, uh, app MN is of type B. But the T apps rule uh, is the more important one where we now see uh, the power of a dependent type uh, because we say that for all X, which are terms, assuming that X is of type A, then uh, m, which was, is a function, right? This m here is a function. So we apply x to m, which gives us this renaming and make sure that this is a new x, which is essentially this, this scope, in this scope. And we say m applied to x is of type b. So this renaming isn't really explicit in this, in this rule up here. Um, we sort of say, oh yeah, okay, we pick some new x and this is good. But uh, it is actually something we need to somehow uh, take care of in some form. So um, hypothetical derivations are just simple function spaces. Uh, parametric derivations turn into dependent function spaces. Um, maybe another thing I should mention is that these capital variable names M, A, and B, they are really abstracted at the outside. We infer their types, so we don't uh, write them. But you can think of read this as saying, you know, for all M and for all A and for all B, if you give me a proof that M is of type A or B, and n is of type A, then I can construct a proof for app mn is of type B. And a derivation tree, like the one here at the bottom, uh, where I first um, introduce uh, the assumption about x, right? and then I introduce an assumption about y, um, is, is encoded by saying, you know, I introduce first the assumption x together with the, um, with the assumption that x is of type nat. And then I introduce an assumption y together with the assumption b, which says that y is of type nat. Any questions so far? So this is some, you might have seen some of this before. Um, this is very much like how you would do this also in 12 or in elf. Um, 
it's not something, it's not an inductive definition, I want to point out, because uh, here uh, you have a negative occurrence of, of XA. Um, the same thing happened in the definition for terms. It's a negative definition, a negative occurrence. You, you say that the argument is, takes in a term to term. So uh, if, if you, you can't write this in Cochrane Acta, uh, this is prevented. It's not an inductive type, it would lead to inconsistencies. So, um, this is why you normally don't have access to this in a, in a general proof assistant. And this will also, uh, you know, means that why, this is also sort of at the heart of the problem. Why is it difficult to actually reason with these things in some sense? Right? Because these are not, um, as I said, they're not really inductive definitions. And, and we will encounter things that are in, in context, right? Because as we, as we analyze these terms and derivation trees, if you look at this, this derivation D, right? Um, then this D here depends on, on, a, on various kinds of assumptions in the X, U, and Y, and D. So as we want to write programs and proofs, we, we, want, to, we want to extract, right? We want to get our hands on D because we might need to do an uh, appeal to the induction hypothesis and we might need to do a recursive call. All right, so let's do a very simple example. Uh, let's look at this a little bit more closely. Okay, so how could we um, talk about subterms uh, that occur in, in these holes, uh, in these LF terms, in these abstract syntax trees? So, you know, um, if I had my, my the, lamb, the terms represented, I dropped the type annotation because it's not that important for this example. Then I want to get my hands on what is inside this box, right? I want to get my hands on, on this, this term. And how would I possibly um, do that, right? And then how do I get my hands on, on this term? And how do I get my hands on, on this sub-expression? So as I said, LF is, is a dependently typed lambda calculus. So the main typing judgment we use in order to verify that each of these terms are, are meaningful is uh, you have an LF term, you have an LF type, and you have an LF context. So um, the first two are terms. Second one is a, is a term of type, an LF term of type oft, uh, lam, x, lam, y, uh, y. And in order to understand the type of each of these box terms, it, well, we need to understand them in the context in which they occur. And so um, if I look at this, this subterm here, uh, oops, then uh, this term has type. Uh, lam, lambda f app f x, where x is in this LF context. So it's, it is an, what we would call an open term in some sense. Right? And now we would like to abstract of what, what this term actually is, because it might be anything, right? If you want to write a pattern that traverses this kind of structure, we'd like to sort of get our, our write a pattern variable that stands for this, this whole. And we need to somehow be able to describe the meaning of this all. And this is where we reify really the, the typing judgment we have on the LF level as an actual type in our system. So you can think of the implication or the function space as reifying what a hypothetical definition says, right? the hypothetical derivation says. You can say that a, a universal quantifier reifies in the language of your logic what a parametric derivation actually expresses. And the contextual type reifies really the whole typing judgment we have on the level of LF. So it gives us a first class way of talking about the type of these, these holes. So in the first line, right, uh, the hole is a term that occurs in the context where I have an X. Second line, the hole or the box uh, would be a term that appears in a context where I have an X and an F. And in the last example, the V is um, an object that has type oft Y nat, and it occurs in a, in a context where I have X. I have the assumption that X is of type nat and Y, and I have an assumption that Y is of type nat. Okay. So. I have a super, super silly question. Yeah. Just to verify that there are no simple, uh, no, there are no silly questions. Yeah. The tilde there is just cosmetics. Sorry? 
the tilde in the last example is not really there. Oh yeah, that's not supposed to be there. That's right. Sorry. Ah. Okay, thank you. So, I just wanted to make sure I'm not misunderstanding that. No, this is a, uh, yeah. So, um, so we would like to name these holes, right? Because it might be more than one. So, uh, so we can we'll add, we enrich the dependent type lambda calculus LRLF uh, with another context, which is uh, a meta context. And now in this meta context, we can uh, list all the holes together with their types. Um, and um, so here I named the whole H and I said, this is standing for a term um, that makes sense in a context where I have X and F. And H is what we would call a contextual variable. Um, and it has this contextual type. Uh, so we write these ankle, uh, these seal brackets in, in, in our theoretical definition. And it can be instantiated with a concrete contextual term, uh, Fx, for example, that contains F and X. Uh, distinction between the typing derivation, which I itself, right, which is uh, just this here, this is part of the judgment, and this uh, this notation over here, which is part of our, our logical notation of the propositions we, we can uh, talk about. So now you might say, well, okay, so that seems uh, nice, but in some sense, every theory we're developing should be stable under alpha renaming, and so you know. Um, whatever we plug in for H may contain some free variables. Uh, so here, you know, we plug in app fx and it contains f and x and we just happen to have chosen f and x uh, the same as we have here in this surrounding context we have. But there's, you know, this is a closed, this guy here is a closed object. So there's, uh, I could rename these variables or I could rename variables here in, in, my, in, in my judgment. And so um, clearly there's, you know, this is, this is very carefully crafted that these variables line up, but uh, we want it to be stable under alpha renaming and renaming. And so in particular, right, if I have here uh, written y and g, uh, right, and I, can I still use h, right? Can I use whatever I plug in for this guy here for, for this h? And in order to do so, uh, we can't just use H, okay? We need to uh, associate H with, with a renaming substitution that does the proper renaming. It does the renaming of uh, mapping G to F and Y to X. So when we talk about contextual variables, they always come with a substitution. That is a very general substitution, but it's essentially a morphism between this context and the context that we are currently presently in. Um, so they, they come as a closure. And that solves our problem of, of alpha renaming. And it's actually even more powerful because these substitutions don't need to be just uh, renamings. They can be any kind of substitution that moves me from one context to another. So they can be weakening substitutions. They could be partial instantiations. Uh, it's any kind of substitution that maps you from one context to, to another context. So that means now we, we have to generalize our, uh, our type system, the work was. And before we had an LF context, an LF term and a type. So that's uh, just as you would in a normal, simply typed lambda calculus, you have an LF context and LF, uh, or you have a simply typed lambda uh, term M, A and a type and context. But now we have also this meta context. And that means we have two different kinds of typing rules for variables. One are the local variables, the LF variables, so if axis of type A, if it comes from psi. And we have these contextual variables or meta variables that are coming from gamma, our meta context itself. And they also have type A, but uh, if we are in a dependently type setting, this A uh, might depend on uh, this context phi. And we actually need to also apply the substitution to A itself to move A into the present context uh, Psi. So um, if you're familiar with modal logic, the, the meta context is sort of uh, global assumptions that are valid in every world. Um, and the LF context is in some sense our present current world. 
Um, and this, uh, you, you might have seen that this, uh, the steel operator um, is a sort of like a modality, like the necessity modality, uh, um, the box modality we have in, in S4. Okay, makes sense so far? Yeah, so, so it allows us to distinguish between these two layers uh, in some sense. So when we define our theory, we are still just working in this uh, with these typing rules themselves. But when we reason right, about terms we've defined, we'd like to um, recursively analyze them. And then we are in need of describing holes in terms and to be able to access them. Okay, so so that was uh, so we defined a contextual model type theory in uh, in two thousand and eight. Uh, there was a TOEFL paper of Alexander Anevsky and Frank Finning, um, and it gives a simply type version as well as a dependently type version, and uh, sort of follows also in some earlier work by Rowan Davies and Frank Finning, where they used uh, the model logic S four uh, for giving a foundation for uh, meta programming or stage programming. Um, and in, in this work, we, we give the, the, the contextual type theory as a, as a variant of LF, uh, and we give a few examples on, on how it can be used to describe, for example, meta variables in the context of unification or, or uh, deal with meta programming in very simple examples. And so Beluga um, sort of built on, on this idea um, in order to write recursive programs about these LF structures. So uh, we can we can sort of think about uh, proofs, um, you know, as uh, almost like an iceberg. Right? So at the bottom, you define your theory definitions, your operations, semantics, the type system, whatever you're working with, your grammar, uh, and there you have to also worry about how to model scope and binding and renaming and substitutions and what are eigenvariables and uh, what is your context and how can you move from one context to another. So this is all encapsulated in the logical framework and then also in the contextual logical framework. So we do it once and for all and you map your object languages inside to this contextual logical framework um, and then you inherit all these properties directly from, from LF. Now if you want to reason about it, um, then we need to have ways of making uh, statements about uh, these terms we've defined. In particular we want to sort of make um, judgment or definitions or statements about uh, saying, you know, but if M has type T in a context gamma, then and M has type S in a context gamma, then S and T are the same. Or we might want to uh, just simply say types are preserved, that if M steps to M prime and M is of type T, then the result M prime will be also of type T. So in order to make statements, um, this is where, this is up here, okay, for terms um, for types. So the language of types in Beluga uh, is essentially a first order logic, okay, with the least and greatest fixed points. And uh, in particular, it doesn't reason about uh, natural numbers or, or lists, it reasons about uh, these kind of fancy things, okay, uh, these kind of high order of sex syntax tree structures. Um, but from, a, from the logical power, um, uh, as Beluga was uh, designed back in 2008 and then we added index types in 2012 and we added the co-induction in 2016. The, the core really is still essentially a first order logic. There's no special, um, there's no special nominal logic or anything there. It's really a first order logic. It's just that the things you're quantifying over are, are coming from down here. So, um, so, so that's, uh, that's also, you see that in the normalization proof of this language as well. Okay, so how does this work in practice? So here's a program size one might want to write, uh, which counts uh, the number of constructors in a lambda term. And it starts out being a closed uh, lambda term. And then you have uh, here uh, one constructor, another constructor, uh, and another constructor. So hopefully we'll get back three. And as you do your recursive analysis, you expose the sub expression, right? That's what you want to do your recursive call on. And that is in the context where you have X. And then you want to do another recursive call, whoops, here, which uh, is in the context where you have X and F, okay? And ultimately, 
we, um, we now need to do another recursive call on f, f and x. And if we have a variable, we'll say that it counts for zero. Okay. Um, but you see that the context grows in each of the recursive calls. Um, so um, so we, we don't really talk about free variables, we talk about variables that make sense in a, in a particular context. There's nothing like free variables in our world. You're always chained to, to the sky or to, to the context. And so if you write this program, it's a program that in general will, uh, will recursively analyze a term in a context gamma. So we do need a way of abstracting off over all these possible variables we might encounter. Um, and then there are three cases. So maybe the last one is the most intuitive or easiest one. Uh, you know, if you have a, an app, MN, you do a recursive call of M in the same context and N in the same context and you add one. Now, if you have a lamb, then you need to extend the context because you're encountering one more uh, free variable, okay? And then you do your recursive call on M. But eventually you will uh, that comes from gamma. So that's indeed the case here. Uh, this is where you have something from gamma. Uh, and this is where we introduce a special pattern variable that will succeed only if it is a variable from, from gamma. So, um, so that's, that's in some sense something we, we need in order to, to be complete, right? Um, and um, the pattern matching is, is now not simple first order pattern matching, it is higher order pattern matching because we need to be able to extract here um, the term M and that M is, um, is a higher order pattern. Okay, so, so you might say, well, how do I prove things? Okay, I'm still not uh, actually proving anything. So here, let's do a very simple example because uh, it's very hot in Montreal. <laughs> we have 32 degrees. <laughs> so, so and, and listening to Zoom lectures is also exhausting. So uh, here's a very simple example, type preservation. Okay. Uh, I think everybody has done a type preservation proof. M is of type B, M steps to N, and N is of type B. So we do an induction on, on S, okay, on this derivation. And one of the cases would be that it is uh, the, the apps rule. And now you have an assumption that uh, this term here is of type B. And we argue by inversion, okay, and we do another inversion that we get indeed our hands on this sub, uh, sub derivation that says that assuming X is of type A, M is of type B. And now we use the substitution lemma, okay, uh, using B and D2 uh, and plugging this into this uh, D prime. So this is a typical case, right? We would wanna, want to do. And how do we translate this into, uh, into a function or a type? Question? Yeah? Is the theorem correctly stated? I think so. Okay, so S derives that what? S is saying M steps to N. Oh, steps. Okay, I was reading that as a function type. Oh, type yeah. preservation. Thank you. Yes, type preservation. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I've taught this before. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Very good. Um, Okay, so indeed, uh, yeah, so uh, it becomes here clear that this is not a function type, it's meant to translate to this stepping uh, judgment or type we have. And uh, this part here translates to the, the encoding of off MB, and then the result translates to off NB. And the orange part sort of makes explicit what the abstractions are. So it's a statement saying for all M, for all N, and for all B. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in Beluga, you don't have to write them. It will be reconstructed. Uh, but they're morally, of course, they're there, just the same way they're morally there in our theorem definition. And you see that uh, we're reasoning about closed directing derivations since we didn't do any uh, reductions inside lambda. So it's a very simple example. Um, but if we would do uh, reductions inside lambdas, then there would be an explicit context, just like in the size example. Okay. 
So, um, so this is this is what uh, we uh, usually then have to do. We would need to define a recursive function of this type, and then we would uh, do a case analysis on our second argument, which is the step, and we would have here uh, the different cases, which uh, how this derivation for step actually looks like. Okay, and um, then we would model our inversion on the typing by uh, another pattern match, which will say, well, actually, you know, you started with uh, an application and then with an abstraction. And so this D prime here is really uh, something that depends on X and U. And here, this is the usage of our substitution lemma. D prime depends on X and U. And we don't make explicit the value we need to plug in. We don't even have a name for it. So we let it infer it, but we, uh, it comes from D2 which actually proves that this value is, a, is of the appropriate type. And the typing, the totality declaration will tell you uh, whether all calls uh, to the induction hypothesis are valid. So in particular, these two uh, question marks here would contain recursive calls and whether uh, the function covers all cases. Now, it's difficult to write dependently type programs. Uh, anybody who has written actor programs uh, knows that and it's difficult uh, you know for you probably to follow completely along and remember what the type of eap1 and eap2 and eap apps is and t app and that's because when we do proofs the types or the propositions are the primary thing we have in our mind right and when i went through the proof on paper i focused on the types or on, on the actual judgments and typing derivations but when we write the program, we now need to focus on these witnesses. And, and that's, of course, not a new observation. Okay? This is an observation that goes back to Larry Paulson when he was thinking about tactic languages in, in Isabel. Uh, but it is really uh, quite, um, it, it, it's a particular mindset. Okay? And it's not, not as, as trivial. And of course, that's why uh, people sometimes like Koch, because Koch, you have actually uh, tactics available to just get the proof somehow done. And when you use tactics, you focus on manipulating the proposition or the statement, right, rather than constructing the witness itself. So um, what I want to show you uh, briefly is how we can do this proof interactively using um, our interactive front end Harpoon. Um, and I want to give you a sort of sense of how this works. Uh, Harpoon will generate, it will have a certain fixed set of actions, which corresponds to the things that we did in the proof. So split, uh, invert, uh, maybe appeal to the induction hypothesis, and it will generate a proof script. And this proof script is somewhat different from the proof scripts you're used to from Koch, because it's not just the linear sequence of all the commands you use, but it's a, actually a structured proof script that um, will retain the scope of uh, sub derivations or and then we can translate this proof script into a program. Okay, so um, so if you're still with me, I'm, uh, I, I can give you a brief uh, introduction how to do this, and I can uh, I'll have to stop the sharing, and I'll have to share with you some other screen, and I'm going to share with you um, my shell. So can you see the the Emacs? Yeah. Okay, so this is this is the encoding you know I showed you before. Um, this is uh, just the same. I, I called it eval, not step, but uh, uh, this is not the one I wanted actually. <laughs> uh, no, this is also not the one I wanted. <laughs> this is what happens when you do. Uh, uh, then you do, I wanted to have a much smaller example. This is the one I wanted. Okay, good. Um, this is the step relation. And uh, we have here our stepping rules. Um, and we have here our, our typing. And um, I also added equality, also equality isn't really uh, necessary for us. And now I want to, uh, I should comment this out. Since uh, we want to do this in ourselves. Um, okay, so this is our signature, and we're going to load this. Um, oops. Uh, 
Uh, so we can call bin harpoon, we give it the signature file wherever it is, and hopefully this works. And now it has read in this file, has type checked all the definitions and constants, and it says, do you want to prove a theorem? And um, I'm going to call this theorem TPS, and I'm going to type in um, the theorem I want to prove that M is of type T, and then I have step MN, and I have uh, of uh, NT. Okay. And then it will say, what do you want to do induction on? And I want to do induction on the stepping. So it says two. Uh, and I'm going, this is, I'm not proving anything mutual recursive. So I'm going to, um, this is my only definition I want to consider. And so it has, um, uh, it tells you what the assumptions are. Okay. And it also, so these are the assumptions that come from the universal quantifiers. And these are the assumptions that come from the actual implication. Okay, from these two. Um, now it will say here um, that uh, these things are not in scope. It means just that, uh, as I've stated, M and N and T are implicit arguments. So when whatever action you're doing, you can't really they're kind of considered implicit through the whole development. So it tells you a little bit what it did. It uh, introduced some. Uh, all the universal you know, quantifiers and all the implications. So we now need to prove that N is of type T. And the, the thing we need to do is we need to, um, we need to split. And we split on, um, on, on X, right? That's what we did. We did proceed by induction on the stepping relation. And so it tells you um, a little bit what, what sort of the course of actions are, how you got there. And it introduces um, <coughs> Uh, it has picked EAP apps, and uh, that means uh, it has here this reduction rule uh, where it has uh, this lambda function sitting inside here, which is going to be applied to, to E, and this is a value. Okay. Uh, so now what we need to do is we need to do inversion on this other derivation. That's what we did in our own paper proof. So we can say invert, or you can do another split. Uh, on U, and it will introduce uh, two new assumptions, D and D1. And uh, now we do need to do another inversion on D1. So um, uh, we can split on, on D1 again, and we have two different commands, either on uh, splitting of an assumption from here or splitting of an assumption here to sort of be a bit more distinct. Um, and uh, so we introduce a new assumption. D2, which depends on these uh, assumptions X, uh, uh, TM, and, and that axis of type T2. And now we're ready to prove something, uh, finish the proof essentially by saying we want to solve this and we can construct the proof witness. Namely, it's D2 and we'll pass in uh, D as the, as, the, as the witness for, uh, for this assumption. Okay, so this is this underscore is going to be E, and we're going to use D uh, to plug these two proofs together, and that means now it has solved this case, and it would now go to the case where it has E app two, for example. Okay, and how would we prove that? Well, we'll do another split or invert on U, uh, which is the typing, and it will now have uh, two assumptions about E and E two. And uh, that means now we want to use the induction hypothesis so we can make our recursive. The way we do use our induction hypothesis is we write the actual um, recursive call. And um, so the recursive call is going on. Uh, we are stepping, what are we stepping? Um, on E, I believe. Yeah, on E. So we'll uh, have D and uh, <clears throat> our derivation on, on ah, yeah, sorry no so we need to we need to in order to do our uh, we need to first uh, um, what do we do f oh yeah f okay so we do by tps uh, d oops, d and uh, f and I can name this by uh, as a new assumption induction hypothesis. 
So I have this assumption here. And now I can say unbox uh, my H to move it, uh, move it up on the, to the meta context so I can actually access it. And I'll call this D2. And so now I have all the things uh, available to construct the derivation for app uh, E2 and E1. Uh, and I would say solve uh, T app. And uh, now I need to get the order right of what I would say. Uh, so it would be D1 and uh, D2. Okay, so now, uh, now I have an error <laughs> uh, because I, it's not called T app. Uh, did I say? This is almost what happens when you do uh, demos, right? Uh, oh, it's called TP app. Okay. <laughs> I, should, no, uh, I mean, this is good. We want a realistic demo. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I didn't write my uh, my yeah, so, so this is this is good. So now um, the uh, TP app. Uh, so uh, still, I didn't do the right thing. I should give it in the right order. So I should give it D two and D and D one. Uh, I should say TP app D two. And D1. And now it's happened. Good. <laughs> um, so the uh, final outcome, uh, since I'm running a little bit out of time, I'll show you what the final outcome of this is when you finish your proof, is going to be quite large. Um, because we think of this as, a, as an internal uh, representation of the proof. But you see here, uh, this is, this is the, the actual uh, representation of the proof script. And uh, it will generate from this proof script directly the actual um, program. Okay? So the outcome will be, in the end, uh, the actual, an actual program that has filled in all the, all the cases. So if you want to see what the, my previous session is of what I, uh, what I saved, um, the, and in the end, uh, you, you get the translation of the program, which is going to look like this. Okay, so um, let me, um, any questions about this? So the actions are sort of, um, at the moment, you know, split by, you can use the induction hypothesis, uh, the name of the recursive call or a lemma you have to find, um, anything like that. Can I ask? That was my cat. If you hear it, <laughs> yeah. Um, when you when you put an underscore, is that just like for an implicit argument, or can you put it explicitly? Like you said, underscore will be for e. Can I just write e, or do I have to put an underscore there? You have to, at this point, you have to put an underscore because E is an implicit argument to all the rules. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so we could make this more lenient, uh, but it's useful to keep the implicit arguments implicit because we want to eventually generate this program. Um, and this program, in this program, all these arguments are implicit. So if you would have written E explicitly in your action, then it would show up here in this final program and E wouldn't be bound. Okay, so, so therefore we would, uh, would prohibit, prohibit you to write E and rather trust that Beluga will find the instantiation for it. Okay, thank you. Because really our final goal is this, this translation. So we don't care that this uh, proof script is, looks extremely verbose. We we'll just put in all the information that is necessary. Um, you know, you can sort of see what we did, we did solve, but it always has, for example, the context in which it operated. Uh, so it's not just listing a list of tactics. So it's very stable under alpha renaming, uh, which is one of the issues you might run into when you use cock, that you rename uh, some, some, some assumption or uh, you add a new constant and then uh, the naming of the, how many assumptions you're getting is off and therefore your whole proof script breaks. This isn't really the same here because you, you always have 
the scope in which uh, a particular action was executed. So the Sorry, um, Birgitte, may yeah. I ask you something? So just to, to be clear about the terminology here. Uh, so what, when you say the proof script, then that's the harpoon proof script yeah. that is the sort of a, like a trace of your interaction with the harpoon shell. And that's then, right. it, okay, and that can be used. Uh, so if you feed that into harpoon, it'll spit out a uh, valid Beluga term or program. That's right. That's which right. is yes. the translation here. Okay. That's right. Cool. Yeah. So this is uh, the master thesis by Jacob Arrington, and he he also um, there's another student, Yung Yong Yang, um, who uh, helped implement it. Um, and we um, we have a theory for the for the proof script, how actions relate to proof scripts. Uh, so every action will produce a val typed state. Um, and then how we can translate the proof script to programs. One could have directly tried to generate programs uh, from the actions, but um, we think, uh, so there are several reasons why we wanted to have a proof script as an intermediate layer. One is seemed clear, um, to um, the script is, in some sense, your actions are very linear. Right, uh, uh, and while the program is, is sort of this nested structure, and so it seemed much easier to first go through this intermediate layer of this proof script language that records sort of these, these actions and, and records the types and the states we have, and then translate it uh, into a program. We also think that this proof script language is a good intermediate language for generating, for example, LaTeX style proofs. So. Uh, because what you have to do when you would generate a LaTeX style proof is you need to get access to all these uh, all these types which are not present in this program. So when we, so I had a student a number of years ago who was looking at a LaTeX translation of these Beluga programs into LaTeX proofs, and the first thing we did was we generated an annotated abstract syntax tree <laughs> of a Beluga program because you need the types. And that's the thing you're you want, you're in, most interested in. Um, and so we think this proof script is a good intermediate layer, which sort of simplifies some of these translations. Um, and so that's why we wanted to give it a, a sort of course class status. Now there's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, so you, know, you might want to not want to write uh, these kind of solve things always by hand. And you saw that, uh, you know, I still got it wrong sometimes. And what order do I have to give the names of the arguments? And what's the name of this constructor? So the next step is to provide more automation. Um, so you can then actually say solve, or at least you have an, an option of either constructing the proof term directly yourself or, or let the a theorem prove it in. So um, maybe I'll, I'll wrap up because, um, um, you know, there, well, I could certainly talk, talk more, much more about other examples. I think you get the gist of the idea. Um, and let me, let me go back to my slides. Um, so you might say, what kind of programs and proofs can we write? Type reservation is a very simple example, and that's definitely true. Uh, but we also uh, done a uh, use Beluga for doing um, a type of server enclosure conversion and hoisting implementation. In this case, it's really used as a programming environment, as you would use it, as you would use ACTA. Uh, so in this case here, you wouldn't take a, a probably this interactive mode wouldn't be that uh, helpful. But we've also done various kinds of inductive proofs. So um, in particular, this normalization example for simply type lambda calculus, and we've recently also proposed something called Puffle Mark Reloaded, which is a strong normalization proof. And we've done those also using Harpoon. So those have inductive definitions and uh, what we call stratified definitions. So, so this, this idea does scale, but it's sort of the same sets of tactics you use, splitting by induction hypothesis, by some lemma, um, you know, uh, and solving. And we haven't uh, extended our, uh, our Harpoon uh, interactive front end to deal with co-inductive proofs, but we, uh, the programming part does support co-inductive proofs. Okay, um, so yeah, so if you remember that uh, 
uh, mechanization proof for the normalized, strong normalization. That's uh, this problem mark reloaded paper. And if you want to play around with it, that's uh, something I'd like to uh, certainly encourage you. I think it's also a good example, you know, where we work very closely with, uh, with Catherine Stark and Stephen Schaefer, who are working on auto subs in Prague. And, um, you know, by sort of really kind of sharing how we think about these proofs with contextual types, I think the way they've adapted uh, their proof, uh, which with an adapted auto subs, is uh, in some way, you know, sharing some of these ideas of how we think about these things. We encode them with, we could encode them with well scoped the brim representations or well typed the brim representations, at least on the level of terms. Now, um, it's sort of limited because, you know, in, in a language like auto subs, you can't encode typing derivations uh, as, as higher up sex syntax trees, right? And that's certainly where some of these limitations come in when you have all typed De Bruyne representations. Um, but, you know, to some extent, the, you can adapt this kind of way of thinking also in a, in a, in a regular or in a, in, a, in, a, in a general proof system. And uh, I think that it has kind of provided a lot of insights in, in how, we, how these different mechanizations compare. So there's sort of three lessons I want you to take away with, I guess. Um, um, and three lessons I've learned when we work with this. So in Beluga, when we did the strong normalization proof, we exploited these high-level abstractions and primitives. We used high OAs, we used context, we had substitutions and renamings. All of these are first class in, in Beluga. And that gave us a very compact implementation of the actual proofs uh, in 460 lines of code. So uh, it's a very compact representation. And these contextual types really provided uh, an abstract and conceptual view of syntax trees. And so I think it, it showed that choosing the right setup simplifies the mechanization. Right? So, um, and that is where, where, this kind of, where this kind of way of thinking can help you uh, in, in this development. And sort of more broadly, the, the directions we're pursuing, I'm, I'm just listing three. One is proof automation. So you saw that in this mini demo on Harpoon. Um, the second one, is um, to grow Beluga into a full dependent type theory. And uh, we've done a start uh, on, on this. Uh, so we had a paper at Lix in 2019, that's last year, um, where we developed a Martin Loew style type theory. So you, would, you, know, you wouldn't have the strict separation of proofs live above the water and the theory lives below the water. And you can only talk about what is below the water as sort of above the water, but you can also refer to computations again in, uh, in these contextual objects. And we showed that this, is, this theory is normalizing. Um, there's also some recent work we have at uh, FOSAX together with Ole Schirp, where we give a category theoretic foundation for, um, for COPAL. Um, so um, to be described of how it relates to, to pre sheaves And uh, so I think that, that encoding is, is kind of interesting as well, if one wants to come from a very different angle. And the third direction we're looking at is applying these ideas to actual meta programming or template programming. So, um, you know, Beluga is really two layers only. <laughs> it's uh, your object language and then you're writing programs about this object language. In meta programming, you have n layers um, and you, um, and the, the language you're analyzing, you know, is the same as the, the language of writing programs. In. So these are two things which uh, which are very different in Beluga. But I think in itself, uh, you know, I think Beluga has been very fruitful in, in thinking about how we model uh, programs within a context or code within a context or any, any kind of abstract syntax tree that we need to want to think about uh, within a context. All right, well, thank you. I think I, I'm way out of time, but uh, <laughs> thanks for, for patience and, and staying with it. Thank you. Uh, so. Usually we thank the speaker by my unmuting everybody, which may be surprising. So, um, <laughs> okay, I will do it again. I think it's, 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 it's a cool idea. So I'll unmute everybody and let's thank the speaker. Awesome. So everybody, now, everybody lives in a different uh, zone. I didn't actually unmute everybody. I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. Know, we started the, the, the sign language. Know, people are muting themselves back in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So question time. Yeah. Any, if you have a question, just uh, start talking. And uh, 
let's see how that goes because we, we don't have that many participants. So we actually, we had, a, we, had, we had the mandatory question. Alexander, do you want to ask it? <laughs> actually, no. That no. wasn't me who asked the oh. question first. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. It was, it was uh, Stefan. It was Stefan. Yeah, Stefan. You have to ask the mandatory question now because you typed it in chat. Yes, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. So the mandatory question was, what do you have to trust uh, in order to trust uh, the proofs in uh, Beluga? So in the end, um, well, trust is sort of a two-part uh, two, two issue. So what is implemented and what is uh, on the theory. So on the theory side, uh, David Thibodeau, who is one of my PhD students, is finishing his PhD. He is giving a translation of a, uh, as part of his PhD, he's giving a translation of a program that has patterns and co-patterns as a structural recursive. And then it's going to be translated into Mendeler style, a Mendeler style calculus. And for that Mendeler style calculus, we have uh, a normalization proof. So um, that is uh, what you will need to trust in the end, on the theoretical level. Um, so um, on the implementation level, <coughs> we don't on the implementation level, we, uh, or we don't do it yet. <laughs> uh, on the implementation level, you have to trust the type checker and the coverage checker and the termination checker. But the calculus is, um, is well, it's a, it's a, you know, it's not a, big calculus, so, the, so in that sense, um, you get a proof, uh, get a proof witness for every, every program or every proof. Um, and the type checker, essentially is the type checker for computations and the left you have to trust. Does that make sense? But I think the actual, uh, the important, from a theory point of view, I think it's important. I, I very much like this work David is doing. It's a very, it was very challenging. Um, but we're basically close to being finished. Um, that we are translating. It's essentially then you have you know, we're translating the, the program the user would write, um, which has deep pattern matching in it, and then we'll translate we disentangle the coverage uh, algorithm, which has deals with this kind of deep pattern matching. It's sort of decompiling coverage into a core calculus where we have. Um, um, fixed points and co-fix points and uh, using Mendeler style recursion. And so for that, we have a normalization proof. That normalization proof isn't really that much harder than one for, I don't know. I mean, it's a little harder than simply type lambda calculus, but uh, because it has, it has a recursion in it, but, <laughs> but not, it's not in any way comparable to what you need to do for, uh, for co for example, which is the full, full Martin Luther type theory. Other questions? So maybe I can um, sort of uh, uh, extend that question. In terms of code, how much code is there that you need to trust? So if I understand correctly, you don't have to trust Harpoon, but you'd have to trust some part of Beluga, right? Yeah, you do need to tr trust at the moment, you do need to trust the type checker, and for coverage, you need unification. So that's the biggest part. Mm. Um, so that's why I think doing the translation into a core calculus where you can get rid of the coverage algorithm is, is beneficial. Mm. Uh, I don't have line numbers in my head, um, okay, sure, sure. but uh, you, um, yeah, you can you can check. Uh, um, in the, it's all on GitHub. The Beluga Lang is the Git repository. Um, but yeah, but if you want, if uh, I think the biggest, if uh, if you ask me, what is the biggest uh, thorn in order to trust the system, which is different from um, let's say twelve. Twelve had you know you do reconstruction that relied on unification, but then you only do type checking. It is going to be bigger because of the fact that. Um, we have to essentially also trust unification for the fact that that's what we use during coverage. So the, the translation into Mendler style uh, sort of allows us to uh, get rid of that. 
component for trust. Thank you. Other questions? Do you have a question? Sure. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a classical uh, engineering question. Uh, uh, how do you handle when you need to introduce several variables simultaneously? How do you handle it in Beluga? You mean in a, in a development, in an object level development? Or? Yes, yes. For, for, for instance, if, if your lambda calculus has a, a, a multi binder. Yeah, it's the same as in 12 feet down. <laughs> 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 uh, so, uh, I mean, you know, if you know how many there are, then you, um, you just abstract over them uh, mm -hmm. as uh, just one by one. Mm -hmm. um, now, you could, you could lift it into an inductive type in Beluga. So that's uh, because in, in, in the inductive types, you have contextual objects. So there you have context and you can describe uh, contextual objects and indeed the you know, accessibility relations or anything that talks about reducibility, uh, which needed to talk about uh, uh, terms in context, especially when we did the strong normalization. That was not on the LF level, that was as a inductive type, which was a relation on contextual objects. So you could think of the context in this contextual object as an NRE binder, if you like, right? Because it has a, has a context. Okay. So that is indeed an interesting question then, you know, like how far uh, or what is a good example one would want to model with these, uh, where you have, this, you have a need for these NRE bindings and you lift it as an inductive type. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Can you even go to a substructural calculator in this, like linear? So, uh, since it is a domain specific language, uh, you don't get any, you can certainly encode um, a linear logic, but you don't get any support for it. Yeah. So, um, we've had a paper at ESOP in 2018 where we described links, which is a linear contextual type theory, which would uh, then extend these ideas to, um, to a linear, uh, you know, supporting linearity generically. But it's not something we have implemented in Beluga. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a question? Can you say sure. more about the totality checking? So um, the totality checker is what is going to determine how fancy a normalization you can prove. Is that correct? Yeah, um, so our totality checker is based on a structural um, measure. Um, <laughs> this is my, my cat who is uh, quite unhappy, but cat. if you want to see him, uh, this is him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, so the, the totality checker is right now just uh, based on the structure of these terms, of these HOAS terms. Uh, it also does deal a little bit with lexicographic orderings. Um, so, but for, I think it really depends on what, um, what theorems you're proving. So honestly, I think all the theorems, even the one in, in Kokon when we did the Lix paper, they were all, they didn't have any super fancy uh, induction orderings. I mean, as long as you were able to do structural induction on these, on these term, on, on these trees, um, you know, there's certainly simultaneous uh, reason, simultaneous uh, induction, and lexicographic inductions, and mutual recursion. Um, but I think maybe maybe it's because of the specific domain we're looking at, and also the you know the the encoding we choose that this is sufficient for us. Now, I think when you do programming, it's very easy to write programs that don't fall within that fragment. So if you do, for example, just you know something like merge sort, where you or um, where you where you need to split your list and then you you sort of merge the results, that's a that usually requires a more complicated uh, induction method me measure, but that's not something we usually see in proofs. Okay, so I mean personally, I feel like you know we should keep. Um, Keep it simple, and I, and I think that's one of the advantages of using a more domain-specific proof environment. Um, that we, you know, I mean, if you really want to use Beluga to implement a merge sort and 
prove that it is terminating, okay, <laughs> you know, go for it, but it's not going to be uh, nice and easy. Um, but uh, it's sort of also not what we're aiming for. Yeah. So, so, so far, I feel like, I mean, I think that was sort of the similar experience in 12. I mean, the, I also worked on the termination checker in 12 and it is purely structural. And I mean, they've, um, you know, they've, they've used it to mechanizing the meta theory of standard ML, including the module system. And it was fine, uh, you know, but because I think all these, these in this particular domain, we, we, we actually don't have these fancy induction orders. Right. Yeah, it might be more fun to prove normalization for a small calculus with a induction recursion. Right. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, there are certainly some things we, we wouldn't be able to express very elegantly at the moment. So induction recursion, I'm not sure how we, you know, just because of the fact that Beluga is sort of this two-layer calculus. Um, you know, I think in Coco, maybe that would be more interesting, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, when, if one goes to more, like induction recursion is probably something I don't know if we are even able to express it at the moment. Yeah. So this is this is where we would definitely need to go to something like Coco, um, and then you know we would need to extend Coco because Coco right now uh, we didn't add in any induction or <laughs> induction So this is something one would need to uh, the focus was really to sort of. Uh, how we can mix and match so this uh, was reasoning within a, a Martin of type theory. Does uh, Thierry know that you're proposing to extend Cocon? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't know. <laughs> okay. uh, can I ask you another question? Um, it's it's so spelled differently, you know. So it's it's a it's a butterfly actually in French. Ah, okay. Very good. Uh, so I was wondering about the contextual objects. Mm -hmm. um, so in the Beluga language, can we actually um, inspect a context, or is that something yes. that is yeah. to you can inspect the context, typing information? Can, yeah, that's right. You, know, you can uh, actually. Yeah. So. Uh, can you do that programmatically? Yes. Yeah. So uh, if you would want to, for example, define. So this this type uniqueness, uh, there is actually a type for context and you can specify that type, uh, how, how these contexts, what kind of regular structure these types have. And in the, in the typing in this, uh, when you want to state type uniqueness, you want to somehow uh, pair uh, the variable that gets introduced together with the typing assumptions that, that gets introduced. And this is, uh, so it's sort of like a sigma type and the, the schema, the CTX schema describes the types or class, classifies contexts in the same way as kinds classify types or types classify terms. We have an additional layer for uh, describing the structure of, of contexts. And that allows us to pattern match and traverse contexts by induction. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that is, uh, that is quite useful. Um, yeah, so it, essentially, it's, it's, uh, it gives us the ability to distinguish between the different variables we have in a context. Right? Like we wanted to, um, wanted to uh, translate a Huas representation into a De Bruyne representation where we need to know uh, what position is a variable in, in this context. We can, we can actually use that by traversing a pattern matching on the context and figuring out at what pos position it is. So in some sense, contextual objects a really a layer of abstraction on, you can think of a well, well scoped or well typed De Bruyne indices as, as what is sitting underneath. That's, that's a good intuition. It's a little bit more than that because we're not limited to just tracking the scope or, you know, one layer. We can, we can, we have, we, we can have very fancy types in LF. Um, so um, there's not, it's not just like, you know, we're not just encode um, um, intrinsically typed terms. We could also give a stepping relation on intrinsically typed terms, um, which then could be again a contextual type. And that that you know that that layer of hierarchy that wouldn't be easily to 
you couldn't be easily replicating that if you just have a, a bell type de Bruyne representation. Right? A bell type de Bruyne representation is usually just for like, terms, not for like typing derivations. Okay. Yeah, so it can get uh, quite fancy, and I think uh, the, our experience is also that um, if you have first class context, you really want to also. Uh, relationship between contexts, so this is what these substitutions give you. There's also, um, in some sense, there's sort of a whole structure on these contexts, right? You want to relate a context that only has terms in it, one that has terms and typing assumptions in them, and you want to sort of maybe have, uh, know that you can always weaken a context that has only terms in it and into something that has terms and types in it. Um, so, um, I think these, this kind of context relationships is still not as well understood as we wish, but I think it's a rich, it provides actually quite a rich framework uh, of thinking about uh, these encodings. Okay, so for example, you could also have, um, if nobody else is speaking up, uh, I'll just continue. Uh, if you could also have a, more than one context schema for a particular language? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so, in the, in, for example, in this example where we do a translation between um, a source and target language, where you have, um, yeah. you have two different contexts. Uh, and because we can abstract over them, we can just, um, yeah, we can abstract over them. And we can have a relation between two uh, contexts. We also have substitutions first class, so you can, this comes into play when you define normalization, because in your normalization proof, even for simply type lambda type, you just want to say something like M is of a well type term in a context gamma, and then you have uh, a substitution that provides closed values for each of the variables in gamma, um, and you want to, so this substitution is reducible, um, and you want to sort of say what the substitution is. So. And we do not only give you context, we also give you first class substitutions and, um, and first class renamings as well. So, um, if you want to do future meta theory, that is something that sort of seems to be quite important. And that's also what uh, auto subs people realize. I mean, you, know, you need a, you need, but the renamings are actually, even when, also when you work with the Bruyne representation, these renamings become important. So. Uh, in many developments, um, and also what Andreas did or some of his master's students, you see that there's a um, you know, general representation of substitutions and then you, from them you can get like some kind of renaming uh, substitution which you then use. So um, this is a common theme that arises. Yeah, no, so renamings, yeah, renamings are always good to have, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so they're, we, 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 they are their first class. Yeah. Um, And I think one should also have weakening substitutions first class and uh, a richer weakening than we have at the moment in the implementation. So at the moment, you can only relate contexts which are of the same shape, uh, but one really should be able to abstractly relate you know, a context that has terms to a context that has terms and typing assumptions, for example, together. So the, um, that's a very natural thing that one wants to wants to do. So one wants to have, one wants to have these kind of context relations. Um, and uh, this is also a theme that has emerged in some of these case studies with uh, Amy Falti and Alberto Omiliano. Um, and I think um, it also seems to come about when we, when we think about the category theoretical interpretation uh, for, for contextual tapes. Uh, so um, I think that is another thing that seems to really emerge out of, uh, out of this study. Okay, any other questions? We are now, I think people will eventually learn it's a lie when I announce the seminar is going to take one hour, but I'll keep <laughs> doing it. Um, <laughs> I'm so, sorry. No, no, it's, no, it's it, every seminar so far has been a bit, so has been of similar length. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, are there any other questions? If not, I see people are slowly dropping off, so uh, maybe we can wrap up unless anybody has another question. So, thank you, Brigitte, again. Uh, thank you. Yes.
We can try the other one. We can you can you can clap like this. Yeah, or um, you can do the silent. Yeah. So this is like in sign uh, language. It's like. Okay. So. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Okay. And I think see you next week, right? We have. Uh, yeah. John Sterling, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Bye bye. Thanks for organizing. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for thank talking. You. Bye. Thank you.